people, other people get in the the place of not having to worry about where their next meal is coming from or where mm-hmm. they're going to sleep tonight and stuff like that. Everybody deserves that. You know what I mean? That's that's the first step in success is stability. I can only describe it as disgustingly positive and needed during these times. I, I appreciate that. Uh, basically what I was going for. Um, I guess my my biggest thing with, with it is I know a lot of people use music as an escape for life. And I guess this is more of uh, a plea to embrace life. You right, know, do, right. do whatever you're going to do and make, make the absolute best of it. And... I absolutely love. Well, I'm a, I'm a huge ska fan myself, so when I heard a, a modern band making original material that was of that genre, I got really happy. You know, the, there's always the joke that uh, ska sounds like what a 14 year old hears in his head when he says he gets extra mo- mozzarella sticks, and I completely agree. I am that 14 year old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Um, yeah, I mean especially since um i don't know if you got to check out the older stuff but the first ep we put out was really garagey mm-hmm. um very like 70s late 70s inspired and so to make the switch from that to almost a more modern you know uh, the rest of our ep is going to be like skate rock type stuff but you know we're all huge ska fans and it just it just came together yeah 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 um well, mixing the the skate rock and the ska, you know, kind of like that whole like Suicide Machines vibe. Yeah, I mean, honestly, as soon as I wrote it, I was like, "Shit, I wrote a Suicide Machine." Song. <laughs> <laughs> if the drumming is as good, then like, fuck it, dude. Right. I was like, "This is half New Girl already." So. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Damn. No, I I mean, I just I impressed myself a little bit, I guess, <laughs> doing something different. And that band had been together for how long now? Oh, forever, basically. <laughs> this way, I mean, yeah, time. they've uh, they've done a lot. I know that uh, you said that you're going to be playing bass for Fear the Spider. Yeah, I've been doing that since November officially, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, that's uh, it's a little bit hard, like I, I guess I would say harder, like skill wise, but a little bit yeah. heavier. Um, um, very like Ramones influence type stuff, mm-hmm. uh, New York and all that. Um, but yeah, that's been a lot of fun. Uh, that's my buddy, Jim, um, his whole project. And I honestly, I have been following them for about five years and I just always had so much respect. And when I finally reached out and was like, Hey, I'll, I'll play bass if you like have me. And he was like, Oh <laughs> fuck. Yeah. I was like, Oh yeah. sweet. Cool. <laughs> like, so it's like the second time that you mentioned Ramones and the 70s garage and punk like that and mm-hmm. stuff is that really where you came into your own musically is that really what just grabbed onto you and didn't let go um yeah I I would have to say I mean I played a lot you know my first band I well I, the first time I ever played live I filled in on bass for a rap metal band right um and then uh I played as far as live goes, I played drums in a band actually with Jacob Campbell. If you remember that kid, obviously you've had Mr. Fang on here. So, uh, uh his is the episode yeah. right before yours. Nice. Yeah. So we've been good friends for, for a long, I mean, since basically since we were both out of high school, uh, we were both like 18 at the time and we were playing with another kid and we ended up starting our own band. Um, and then after that, you know, we were trying for the skate pop punk kind of thing. And I, I'm not, I wasn't that good at melodies at the time. You know, I wasn't like a, a singer that well, but, uh, I, I watched, you know, CBGB came out about that time and I got really into the dead boys and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and Iggy and all that stuff. And I just, I was blown away and I was like, this is, this is really what I want to do. I mean, you know, I was a metalhead in high school and it just it was like too much. 
like there was just so much to keep track of that it was like man if i got four chords and i can yell fast <laughs> i'm good you know yeah and so you know and i can put on a show so uh you know the dead boys were a huge influence there where it's just like dude this guy's fucking nuts Steve vader's is crazy yeah so um a lot of that and i mean i grew up listening to rancid and the smiths and stuff like that so it was never it was never a far far stretch um my dad was really cool musically at least that way he uh gave me a lot of my start with that that's really cool because when i was listening to the bass parts for fear of the spider the first thing i thought of was rancid and then i was like okay <laughs> so then i was listening to the bass parts for your newest single and then i was like okay i <laughs> I, I see how it all comes together now and it's really funny that you mentioned jacob because uh, he had zero idea that you were going to be on here. And I'm sure you had zero idea <laughs> he was going to be on here. And you happened to be right after him. Right, yeah. When I saw him in the chat this morning, I was like, dude, what's up? Like, <laughs> dang, like, it, it's been really cool to reconnect with him in the last couple of years. With, yeah. You know, him having his own band and me sort of doing the same thing. So that's, I, I'm really proud of that dude. Like, that, he's come so, so insanely far, like... It's it's really cool to see him fronting his own thing, yeah. As opposed to always playing second gun, mm -hmm. you know. It was, he took over bass duties so. for Two Tone Cadillac when I left, mm -hmm. and uh, I do remember that. That yeah. was that's basically like when we we kind of went separate ways um, musically because he you know obviously super busy with that and yeah. doing his own thing, and we had just been in a band together, which is funny. I hope he sees this because we're <laughs> we're going on tour this June and we're playing. We're playing a show with our old drummer, uh, John Graves, up there. So that it'd be a crazy old reunion. Oh man, I imagine that uh, the camaraderie that'll be had. You're, you'll have to like definitely film if there's an after party. I, I have to see that. That's gonna be oh, a yeah. good one. <laughs> so with this new yeah, single, really just decided to really, really, really hardcore focus on the the ska sound. Is that a indication to anything that might be coming in the future? Um, so it's, it's obviously our sound isn't going to be totally ska. It's mm -hmm. a little, I feel like it's a little limiting. Um, and I, I said our first EP is very garage. I'm really into John five type music and stuff too. Yeah. So we're, we we're in, it's in the talks to put out like a heavy EP, just call it the heavy EP and put out a couple, <laughs> yeah. you know, like almost metal sounding songs. And that's honestly with our new live uh, split that's coming out. A lot of the re reviews have talked about how we're on the heavier and have metal kind of stuff because of our song Melt My Brain because it's like super riffy and stuff like that. So I I, I'm, I guess I'm not trying really hard not to get pigeonholed, yeah. but I am putting out a lot of stuff that especially when we play it live, it connects, but it's different. So I I've seen plenty of bands that you're like, I don't really know what they sound like. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of keeping the flow, um, especially when we play live with the stuff that's not, you wouldn't necessarily expect it from the same band. So, uh, you know, as far as your bass playing goes, I mean, I've heard just so many different sounds come from it. When is there any bass player that when you pick it up, you're like, no matter what I try to avoid, this ends up coming out or, uh, any other instruments when you pick it up that you're just like, this is the one influence that I can't get away from. I know you said John five. So, you know, I imagine that you listen to a lot of right. instrumental music and stuff like that. Right. And I honestly, I'm, I'm really picky. Um, I don't play bass in wrath and the wise guys. I do just play guitar and front. And so, um, it is weird because I do write a lot of bass lines that my bassist, he, he still does his own thing. And that's, I, I really appreciate that. Um, as, as the person who like writes the songs and gives it and kind of like to mm -hmm. be like, here's, you know, here's my bones and you take it. But, um, as far as bass, I try really hard to just make what sounds best, I guess. Yeah. I don't really try for a style. Um, I know that at certain times you just, you know, there's a, a place to fall back and there's the place to really, you know, start doing walks and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, I, when it comes to being a support member, mm -hmm. I guess, if you, if you want to call it that, I just try to be the best 
support whatever is going to make the song sound yeah 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 where the song needs to go not necessarily try to shine on my own mm-hmm. but you know what whatever the song needs you know yeah um, i always get curious about that because you know as a somebody that sings and plays guitar in your own band you have to write the other parts for the music so i'm always curious uh what kind of ideas you're having when you're writing parts for other people uh that's one of the things that I always find is really cool about I guess the best word for it is band leaders people that write their own music and then they ask okay. you know people or pay them money and say hey can you can you play this and uh you know no matter what certain influences are always going to be coming in when you're writing a, a bass line for a set of chords because you know as you're banging right. on you know, like uh, you said, with punk stuff, you know, you take four chords and you're banging on it. You know, you either have the choice to just follow it along or connect it via a walk. And from what you listen to, that's really going to determine what your rhythm section is going to sound like. Right. Right. And um, I think, especially with Wrath and the Wise Guys, I think me and my bass player are on the same wave. Like he knows, he knows when to play, you know, play root notes and exactly when to start going crazy with it and it's mm-hmm. it's a lot it, it is it is pretty ska influenced especially on his side too i mean rancid like against all authority from down yeah. here yeah and that's why i asked bands like I, that I were, hear that stuff right uh my biggest um i guess the word that i use is dynamic yeah um you know you want a lot and, and that's our thing it's a whole flow it's a it's a show and it's it you want a real emotional reaction so we have a lot of ups and downs and so it's just knowing when to hold you, you know knowing when to do the right thing <laughs> yeah dynamics you know whether you're going to bring it down real quiet and then bring it back real loud or you know make sure you hit that that really cool like mousetrap ending that nobody expects the song just ends and everyone goes what right. oh, hold on fuck it's over and they don't know to clap yeah <laughs> those are the yeah, best and honestly it, it's funny, our, our bassist, or no, our lead guitar player, Kelly, a couple months ago brought to our attention that we only had like one song with a hard stop ending. And so, of course, then the whole practice was, <laughs> all right, we're going to hard stop everything. <laughs> he's like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to say anything again. I'm <laughs> just going to spend the rest of the but, practice no, I mean, just like, closing the fucking door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's, like I said, that's what I go for. I go for dynamic. I don't want every right. song to sound you know, to end the same or, you know, everything should have its own and it's all right. And I told him it's lazy songwriting, to be honest, by the end of it, it's like, you know, grandiose ending. Fuck it. The the big arena ending with like, you know, like the full on like pentatonic movement from here to here with like the drum solo and everything. What's wild is we actually do end our set like that. Um, And it, it, you know, it's great the way that we do it. And I, people got really over it for a while and now i don't see anyone do it and so like i'm glad to bring that back everyone's like oh wait, that was our last song bye it's like i didn't even know that was gonna be your last song like damn like i mean you know everything should have it should have a grandiose yeah, ending it's sort yeah. of like oh shit like i'm gonna fucking miss this like yeah you know not to every song but at least the yeah, set yeah. you know it, 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 if it deserves it <laughs> you know if you if you're feeling really good about it, you're getting a good response. But I sort of do understand if it's a fuck it night to just, you know, cut it and go. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to go out with a bang and not a whimper. I always think of uh, like the yeah. story of when Pantera got signed. They were just playing in the shitty airport bar and nobody was there. So they were just giving it <laughs> everything that they had because nobody was watching. And it turned out mm-hmm. it was an A&R, you know, cat laid over from his airport. I mean, from his flight and just like. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. And it was just because they gave it the large one and didn't phone it in when nobody was there. It's, it's, you know, that's so crazy. Yeah. I mean, the Van Halen story is the exact same, yeah. you know, they played on a night with seven people in the crowd and the next week they had a contract. It's yeah. It, it, there's no reason not to, if you're going to go up on stage, you know, even if it's just for yourself, you should use it as your, your own emotional release. And yeah, if you can't exactly. do that, well, it's shit, therapy. like that sucks. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know. Those nights where the bartender asks if you can watch the bar so he can take a piss. <laughs> uh, yeah, That's yeah. when you're like, we aren't doing this for the Maseratis. I know this. 
Yeah. But yet we continued. <laughs> right. <laughs> What age did you start playing, right, man? Just, because you said that you were a metalhead in high school, so I'm sure, obviously, that stuff like leaked into your playing. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I I, I didn't study too much. Um, I didn't practice much other than, like, chords because mm -hmm. that's what I was good at. Um, my memory really sucked at that time, and the more I look back into it, uh, I attribute it to, like, a lot of anxiety. I was a really anxious kid, and so I think that fucked up my my ability to memorize uh, like scales and stuff like that. So that was always, and I was, I mean, I was bored. Mm -hmm. So you know, sitting down and playing scales a hundred times just didn't really appeal to me. So I would pick up. I mean, I did the classic thing where I'd pick up a Ramones record and just learn it front to back by ear because that was easy as shit. And then, I mean, I my favorite band. I, I have to plug the Smoking Popes because they're my favorite band in the whole world, and those records really showed me dynamic and really like big songwriting there's his his chord progressions are just long they're enormous chord progressions that are kind of all over the place but so beautiful and it just taught me to be kind of weird but it could sound good you know um but yeah i mean like i didn't get too into leads i mean until like the last couple of years mm -hmm. really <laughs> Did you find during COVID that you just had a lot more time to woodshed? Kind of, yeah. I mean, honestly, that got me more back into recording and songwriting. And that, that's my biggest thing is I'm a songwriter. So it's really hard for me to just pull out and start the solos and stuff. I mean, I can get a general bit of what I want, but I'm not even that creative when it comes to that. And my, mm -hmm. my I'm very fortunate because my lead guitar player right now is fantastic <laughs> and can do just that. He's so yeah, fucking yeah, good. Yeah. But, but with COVID, um, I, I actually was hosting a weekly YouTube radio show, uh, like live thing, um, featuring bands and stuff. And then my partner kind of quit and we couldn't get back together. So I did the live stream show thing with a couple of bands. And then, um, I, I just bought recording equipment. You know, I bought myself a condenser mic and the interface and a MacBook and everything. And I was like, I'm just going to start putting songs out again and trying to form a band. Cause that, that was my idea when I was 18 was like, I'm just going to write a bunch of songs and record them. Cause I, I know the instruments so I can at least make good enough demos to send to people and be like, Hey, this is what I have. Cause I, I get really frustrated jamming, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like it, it always seems to me and with the people that I've jammed with previously to try to write that it just never forms a cohesive actual product that really sounds good. And I, I, I mean, I, I'm a good songwriter. You know, I, I've realized that I've, I've done it a lot and I've mm -hmm. sort of, you know, I've, I've proved it to myself that I can write some yeah. pretty damn good songs. So, you know, I'll stay up all night and, you know, I'll, I'll take acid or something and I'll write <laughs> four songs and demo them all out in a night. And I, I don't have lyrics yet, but I, I deliver pizzas. So I take my demos and I listen to them all night while I'm delivering and I can write lyrics and stuff like that and then right. send them to the guys and they put their flavor on it and it's, it explodes. So, um, yeah, as a yeah, songwriter, I mean, that, that really started with the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a songwriter, you know, when you have a good song, because it's almost like in the way right. that Quentin Tarantino said that if you're a fan of movies, it's really, really hard to make a bad movie because you get that filter sort of built in where you're like, okay, mm -hmm. if my musical heroes list them, was to listen to this song, would they approve of it? And I know that, uh, you know, we obviously make art simply for ourselves to get our emotions out and whatnot, but also right. we've had so many great, I would say, templates laid out before us by so many musicians with uh, how many different things you can do with music that it's, uh, it's absolutely impossible to not bite something. Right, yeah, totally. I mean... It's, uh, I don't want to say that it's like extremely hard to be original these days, even though I, I definitely believe it is because I'm in that sense of like everything that's good has been done before. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old, you know, I, I feel that. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's still difference. I mean, like when people hear our music, one of the best, my favorite compliments is that like, man, it feels like I've heard it before, but it is so different. Like yeah, I, I definitely yeah. haven't heard this and like, 
So I sound like a bunch of your favorite artists that you wish would keep making music like that. And I just, <laughs> I picked it up and kept going. And I don't, you know, when I heard, you, when I heard the new single, I was, uh, I was really blown away. I, I, I like I said, I, I described it already as disgustingly positive, and it's really what we need in in these times where you know it's really hard to look at somebody below the age of forty and say there's still good stuff is going to happen in this world. I promise you, just like stick around. Right, and it and it is hard because I'm I am conscious of you know people that. You know, I, I had a really good childhood, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I didn't struggle at all there, but I also, when I left my parents, I made a lot of bad choices and ended up, you know, we, I've been homeless and I've, you know, for a very short amount of time and in, in a better place than most of that population. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, I've seen where people come from and it's very impossible to even get uh, a foot in where you want to go and I was very fortunate to have the upbringing that I did to at least see the possibilities and what I see in a lot of youth is there's no motivation to do anything good like nothing really matters anymore and I I want to change that you know it's really hard to make people believe that they'll make something of themselves or that even that integrity matters and that you know, it sort of just seems like it really doesn't matter. Like I'm stuck where I'm going to be and my mom's stuck still working in pizza. And, you know, why, where the fuck am I going to be? You know, like my, my whole family's fucking poor. And, you know, like I said, it seems like everything's been done. And so it's, you know, without succumbing to the whole, we have to be a Twitch streamer or I have to really latch on to all the modern crap you know, I'm, I really am trying to take it back to the, the fucking green day method and, you know, just put out really fucking good music, put on a really good show, book my own tours and just prove to people that, you know, every, everybody talks about how social media active and how obsessive you have to be to make it in a band. And I, I, I don't want to say I suck at it, but it definitely slips my mind and then I'll go back to it and we make really good videos and stuff. So it's, it's not hard to, to attract people to that but i i want to show people that you don't have to do all of this modern stuff to do what you want to do and escape that that feeling of like i'm just not going to do anything you know it's yeah. either i either figure out how to break into the corporate world or i'm stuck fucking slinging pizzas the rest of my life and like oh it pays the bills but like fuck that man like i'm bored like I, I pay the bills you know what i mean like what's next like there, there's so much more and I know that just by playing some shows over the weekend and putting out some good music and just continuing to do it and have faith mm -hmm. in what's going on it's it I mean it's doing really well for us so I mean it's it's not there's no speedway to success the way that we're doing it and I'm really comfortable with the speed and with the the way that we're doing it you know because we're I I make sure to maintain my integrity and do everything right and make connections and thank everybody and to just constantly check myself um and you know it ends up feeling like i'm i might hold myself back but i i told my wife this morning i don't want to get successful and then look back and somebody's like hey man you stepped all over me and i'm like D i had no idea yeah you know i i just i want to constantly show how grateful i am for everything because it, it this is such a huge privilege to even be able to play music to right, have right. to have a mind for it to, to have anybody come to a show especially with technology now there's no reason for anybody to go out right. i mean you don't have to there's live stream shows there's everything and the fact that people want to still come out and i mean see us is fucking insane like i grew up with such horrible self-esteem that like the fact that anybody says anything is like wow like like i'm i'm just you know i'm blown away by the fact that people like anything that i do it's my coffee maker excuse me it uh has to turn itself <laughs> off and it's from Europe so it makes strange sounds. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Yeah, I think that, Well, you know it's good, you know. I I think that this single is sort of like uh it's like the antithesis of the black pill. You know, there's just so many people who uh they're like you said they're everything sucks. Uh you know, I have no money and it's not going to get better. And I'm really hoping that when they hear this song, 
just possibly they might want to also pick up an instrument and be like, you know, this is giving me that kind of like, it's going to be okay, but also kind of fuck you to the world. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I, I could learn this song, you know? And, uh, when people put original music out, I always like to think about that because I know when I was learning instruments, I was learning other people's songs that made an impact on my mm -hmm. life. And I mean, how cool is it that maybe one day that's exactly the news you get? Yeah, I mean, I, I really hope it does. Because like you said, I mean, it's it's almost like the world does expect you to just kind of give up. Like everyone's sort of telling you like nothing, nothing really matters. I mean, we're getting to the point where small businesses are it, it's almost like a bad investment you know you meet all these people that are hopeful to to free themselves from the the grind and everything goes under and everyone's just you know just give up and just run the mill and i i do really want to be the opposite and i kind of just i mean i i have a lot of you know anger to direct but i it was anger at anger i guess mm -hmm. and it's just i'm tired of yeah, writing pissed off songs when i can write songs about i i am happy you know, like I, I don't have to pretend that I'm mad at everything all the time. I'm really happy with, with what I'm doing and the right. way my life is going. And dude, I'm, I mean, I'm in a shithole trailer right now that I don't know if you can tell by the paper blinds that are ripped with the light coming through and shit, but you know, I'm happy where I am, yeah. especially because yeah. I know that I have something good and I know that I'm doing better and working myself out of this and really, you know, especially doing it. And it's not myself, my wife fucking, she works her ass off. So we can help with everything that we do, but you know, it's the fact that we're putting in so much work and effort and all of, all of that work is seeming to be a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful that, I mean like, yeah, there's annoyances of shows. There's no parking. It's fucking hard. You there's, three hour drives and gas and oh we didn't even make any fucking money but yeah 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 the feelings i get there compared to i mean i love delivering pieces i can't even complain about my work like i love i i get to make people happy you know <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. i bring you food so i i really like just any kind of work that i can do that actually makes people happy because i i believe the the point of work is to give back to your community you know it's if we lived in a moneyless society, the whole point of going to work is to give back to to people that you don't normally get to. And so um, I really enjoy that and just being able to make people happy. And that's why I try to put out really good music and put on a really good show, because it's just if you're going to come out, why leave? Why leave bored? Right, you know, you, right, right. Hey, you know, most of the time you paid to come out, but you're going out. You're trying to have a good time. And so am I. Yeah. So. There's just nothing no, I, worse I, than going to see a band and being underwhelmed. Where you know you mm -hmm. you, you go and you see them and you got the, they they look like they got their stuff together and they're they're kicking some ass and then the ending is quite as good as it could be. But then like for the next song they kind of like gather on the stage and do the huddle and figure out what the next song <laughs> is going to be. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I'm not saying you got to There is nothing wrong shit, with that. But, but when you're going to be at that touring level that you're at, you have to bring it. Yeah. You have to deliver. You have to, you, you honestly, you have to make everybody forget about the show that they saw last week. Yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. And one of the biggest things is, local bands why don't they why don't people come out to our shows and it's like well because they saw a video of you last week and <laughs> it was yeah. kind of boring dog like and it's just how it goes you you never want to be the bad guy and that's why my my thing is lead by example yeah. you know watch us look how much work we're putting in up there and we're having the best time of our lives like if you're not having fun up there they're definitely not having fun out there so you know you got to get up there and really really enjoy what you're doing and not just, Oh, I'm going to play a song, you know, like, Oh, that was a cool song. <laughs> it's show you know, business, like, not looking at fives for that, but <laughs> it's, eh. I know you said that your wife has been essential to, I suppose your operations that you have going on. And uh, I got the Instagram link and liked it and stuff is does she take care of all the business end while you take care of all the creative end. Um, I wouldn't say she take care takes, I mean, she has helped fund a lot of it, uh, where I have worked 
my job, you know, we had a kid and so she had a more promising day job and sort of took that corporate route and she's done a lot of good things. She trains and she recruits. Um, so she's sort of in the same boat where she's happy providing people with jobs. Right, and, right, right. Um, helping to help us escape also having to stay in the yeah, corporate yeah, grind yeah. because it's, you know, it's not where most people actually want to be, but, um, she, she definitely has, I mean, she's always been there. She's always been uh, a big archivist and a big fan. You know, she's always been the one there taking pictures and videos. And we, I, I, I had the opportunity to help her move into a, a more professional photography space with that. And I've been really happy to see her taking off and doing more, um, with that. And that's actually why we did the, the yearbook that I mentioned, the punk rock yearbook for the scene. Um, because we had so many pictures and it's like, yeah, pictures are great for social media and whatever, but what happens when Facebook gets deleted or, yeah, you know, yeah. any of this stuff. And, and at the same time, like, what is a scene if we're, nah, we're just going out and playing a couple shows, you know, like, um, so yeah, she's, she's, I mean, she's been a lot of things. Um, She's definitely, I mean, she helped me get more serious about the business side, definitely. Um, you know, keeping more inventory of merch and, you know, these spreadsheets and all that stuff where I, you know, I was good at handling cash and whatever mm -hmm. and putting it where it needs to go. But, you know, actually solidifying and stuff that labels want to see and all that stuff to really um, track everything that you're doing. And I mean, I'm, I'm decent at it and I have all the, all those ideas, but she really definitely pushes me to sit down and do it. And if I don't, she just fucking does it. So yeah yeah <laughs> it's pretty important yeah there, there's nothing um, quite like having that that support system because it's, it gets so difficult being able to have to create and still also handle a lot of the business and stuff too when you have somebody who can uh who understands that and they're happy to do it because they believe in you and they believe in the project that you're doing man you just can't beat that because you know you mentioned the word success earlier and really, the word success is just such a fickle word because, you know, it's determined by everybody. Right. To some people, success is having a guitar-shaped swimming pool. To some people, is being able to tour but never having to touch the steering wheel or set up your own gear until it's time to play. And then some people's success right. is just being able to play their favorite Eric Clapton lick. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, like... I I guess what would be defined for me is to just not as not have to go to my pizza job and for her right. to not have to go to her, mm -hmm. her corporate thing. It's just, I, I, I do a lot. And so a lot of my time is eaten up by creative projects. And so for even, even, if, you know, wrath and the wise guys, isn't the big thing or, you know, if fear the spider is the bigger thing or, you know, like whatever becomes anything, it's just, I want to be able to do all my stuff and not really have to worry about paying the bills. You know, and and I mean, of course, the next level is be able to give back as much as possible. You know, we're starting a nonprofit. I mean, like I said, we were affected by homelessness. And so one of our biggest things is to help um, give back and see what else we can do um, for that population, because there's it's really hard to get help. I mean, like there, there are definitely resources, but they don't really go anywhere. Um, nobody really helps like with stability and or even you know, right here, like, it, it's just such a, a weird space to be in because everyone tells you where to go mm -hmm. and then you go there and they're telling you to go somewhere else and, well, we can't really help with that. Talk to these people and, or we can give you a bunch of food, but you have to have a stove to cook it. And when you're living in a motel, you don't have a stove. So it's, you know, there's, there's really, it's just tough. And so we want to figure out where to pick up from there. And, you know, even more, than that um but yeah i mean to just not have to worry and also try to help people other people get in the the place of not having to worry about where their next meal is coming from or where mm -hmm. they're going to sleep tonight and stuff like that everybody deserves that you know what i mean that's that's the first step in success is stability well uh you know that sort of altruistic nature sometimes is very very difficult to find in musicians especially front people especially front people who are songwriters <laughs> so it's an extremely refreshing uh i guess it's just a breath of fresh air because your personality and your your ethos really matches the new single it's not like 
you're uh, you're putting on a mask to try to um, you know to prove that you're angry because you're playing punk or, and stuff like that. You're like, no, uh, everything's going pretty good. I'm uh, I'm pretty happy, and it's making its way into the music. And you know, it's the same way that you know, if life shit, it's real easy to play the blues. <laughs> Right, right. And I mean, like, yeah, I don't I don't think I could have or almost anyone could have written a song like Paradise if they weren't there and really feeling right, it. You know? Exactly. And That's why that I was, you know, I. Yeah. Right. And I, I mean, I pushed really hard to get uh, our first EP out as sort of a basis of, you know, this is where we come from. You know, we're not faking this shit, you know, like we're fucking garage punk rockers. Like, yeah. you know, you know, we're, we're about what we talk about and then we can move on to the other. I, mean, I don't want to say it's like no effects style pop punk, but it's definitely, you know, it's skate, it's mm-hmm. driven and it's it's not that typical. I have to yell and I have to grit my voice and I have to do this to prove you know that right we're not posers <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> like I, I, I always you know there was definitely that fear coming out with anything a little too poppy that's like oh you know that look at this long-haired hippie guy he doesn't know what punk is and it's yeah. like dude punks were pissed off hippies that's all i am i'm a pissed off hippie man i love everything i love life i love everybody and i hate the system i hate the ultra rich i hate these assholes who you know make us feel like our lives are controlled by them because it's not you can do anything you want and yeah you're gonna face a lot of bullshit and it's not gonna be easy that's the way the system's set up but you either roll over and die or you work your ass off and i am also understanding that that still comes from a very privileged point of view because not everybody can just work their ass off and get to where they want to go right you know and that's where i want to be able to pick up and help the disadvantaged you know because everybody who has the ability to do it fuck you if you're not you know, like, I understand calling people lazy because, nah, you could totally do it. But I've also seen the other side that there are plenty of people that, like, nah, that's not how it works. Like, you're going to get fucked with your whole life. Like, and there's there's not a whole lot you can do. You know, people, I love the the old conservative, no one, no one made anyone smoke crack. And it's like, dude, have you, I don't know if you've met real poor people before. Because there are people who, like, were five years old and their parents were like, no, you smoke this so I don't feel bad. And they get their kids hooked on crack and it's like, what do you fucking do? Like, people are fucked. And, you know, but there's a lot of us who aren't. And those are the people that, like, shut the fuck up and do something. Just do something. You know, you feel so much better if you just did something. But there's so many people that, you know, they're, they're screwed from the beginning. There's, you know, like there's not very many people that can actually come from horribly abusive parents who didn't give a shit about education, didn't tell them to go to school and that they need to do this. You know, my parents were hard on me because that this is, they showed me drive, you know, they, yeah, I should go to college and I should do this and whatever, but I form my own thoughts. And what matters is that you're working and you give a shit, you know, yeah. do something. Have a little gumption. But at the same time, mm-hmm. make sure you're taking care of your fellow man. Right, right. I mean, it, and if you're not, you know, like I said, stability is the first key to success. And you really can't help anybody until you've gotten your own stability. Mm-hmm. But then once you have it, I mean, do more. I don't, you know, I, I hate to I hate to be the Henry Rollins guy, but like I don't you know, I don't play video games. I don't do shit like that because if I play video games for four hours a night and I bitch about my life, I feel like an asshole. Like I you know, like I have friends who do that and they're like, Man, I can never get ahead. The scene doesn't like me and I'm like, Well, you don't do anything for the scene. You show up and you play shows and you leave. What I mean, what respect do you really garner there if you're not asking what you can do or how you can help or showing up early and staying late and and doing shit like that everything is so much work if you want success like it doesn't matter if you think somebody got it easy you're not going to get it easy so do the work i suppose with local musicians as opposed to when you're touring when you're touring you know it's a whole lot of hey how's it going play the show you know back to the hotel and that's that when it's a local scene you know you have a chance to hang around, make sure you see the other acts after you're done playing instead of walking out. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that just, you know, basic scene rules like that. Don't talk shit about other people in public. And, uh, you know, those, right. those are the, those are certain, I'd say, aspects of local band and community musicianship that you actually can take on the road. There's, there's so much that you learn from being able to just um, navigate a local scene with tact that comes in so mm -hmm. handy when you go out on the road because especially when you meet other bands and then other bands know other bands other bands talk and if you're out there acting a the fool yeah you're out, yeah if you're not doing it right and uh you know people talk right and honestly we do try to do the same thing on tour um since it's so diy and low budget we yeah. i mean we'll show up early we'll stay through all the bands we you know we do the whole thing because honestly that is how you make more connections. You you find out where other good music is, and you're like, shit, I never would have known about this band. Right, right, and like, right. I'm gonna ask you guys to come on tour next time. Like, you know, we 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 still bring a lot of that same what you should do as a local band because we still are. You know, just because we're touring doesn't yeah, mean we're not a yeah. local band because we're not. You're in a nobody van. knows about us. You know what I mean? You're <laughs> in a van. That's what I always say when I would meet musicians who kind of, right. they you know they're a little more of uh, the cork sniffing variety you know they think they're better than you because you know maybe they have all vintage gear or whatever and i'm like you you showed up in a van too right right you right. I, I i i don't see your bus i don't see your learjet i don't see your roadies right well who's who are you guys taking turns driving or who's <laughs> driving? you know like come on it's, uh, it's work man you know that's it's work yeah, you know, and that's, uh, yeah. I, I'm here to work. I like the work. I, I, I am just one of those guys. It's like, man, if you're going to bitch about the work, you don't have to be here. That, that's the biggest thing. This ain't McDonald's, man. You got, this isn't your guaranteed job. No. Like if you don't want to be here, fucking go because I don't complain. Like the smallest complaints. Oh, you know, I wish we weren't playing last or whatever, but again, you don't even say it. You don't say yeah, it in public. Yeah, yeah. You don't say it here. Like I wish I played a show Friday. We didn't go until one in the morning. Still a, still a decent crowd, so I wasn't that upset, but the whole show was supposed to start like an hour earlier. Yeah. And yeah. It, who cares? Who cares, man? I'm not – every show, they're all different, and they're all worth it. It doesn't matter if you impress one person. You know, one person came up to me after the show, and they're like, dude, I'm so glad that there's somebody keeping punk real. And I was like, dude, that, yeah. that's all I need. You know, like it's – and I don't even need that. I know I did a good fucking job. So if I spent a night out and I drove three hours there and back, and who gives a shit? I had some good fucking wings afterwards. I uh, I got to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. And that's that's the goal is do what you want to do. I'm I'm glad that I get to do what I want to do. You know. Yeah, totally. And when it comes to touring too, I I think that shit. Don't get me wrong. Getting to play and stuff is wonderful too, but. The drive there was you and your friends in the van. And <laughs> that's some of the most fun about the whole thing. And that's why I've always yeah. said that, like, the best day on tour was better than the best day at work. You know, I mean, I've been in the military and I've worked a, a number of jobs. I, too, myself had a, a bout with homelessness. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny because... It's music like yours that gets people, you know, through bouts like that. And um, thank you. But man. When I was thinking about touring, you know, <laughs> it literally got to the point where we could speak in code from inside jokes from being <laughs> in the van. And I know that uh, with awesome. you going out as a, you know, uh, I suppose a hired bass player for Fear of the Spider. Um, have you felt that you've really been able to connect with that band seeing as it's not your own from the ground up? Um, yeah, absolutely. Actually, because over the last couple of years, I've become really good friends yeah. with the lead singer and the guitar player who, who formed the foundation. And so honestly, their drummer left first. And I was like, man, if I had the equipment, I would jump right on for you guys, especially because I know how hard it is to find a good, consistent drummer who plays what you want to. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, you know, you talk about how everyone talks about how singers have the ego, but if you've ever met a drummer, <laughs> holy shit! Like, <laughs> no, I'm not playing anybody else's kit. Kit, the house kit sucks. I paid fifteen hundred dollars for this. I'm not playing what you told me to play. This is how I play. It's like holy shit. 
all right, you know, you, you do it because there's only one in the scene. So, <laughs> but, you know, we, I see myself as a very good support member because I know my plays. And, you know, we had worked together before. I had booked them on some shows and actually like quite a few shows before that. I um I interviewed the lead singer for my podcast and stuff. So I was I was pretty in tight um, with them before that even. And now it's, it's just so much more even so, especially because he knows that I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about. I know the business side. And so we can really vibe on especially where what their music needs to do and where they need to go as opposed to my own music where you know there's just there's different dynamics and i think they appreciate appreciate that and i have a lot of fun doing it too um being in a place where i don't have to write you know i don't have to i don't have to think too hard on this i can really show up and do my job um <laughs> um I guess, yeah i just i know what you know, I, I know what Fear the Spider needs as opposed to my own band and how to, you know, the conversations that we have, you know, we're, we're Wrath and the Wise Guys is, I wouldn't say we're playing a lot of shows, but I play a lot of shows. Um, I have another band that backs me up and that actually, that goes on tour with me, the Social Infants. Um, so when the Wise Guys aren't available, they actually approached me one day seeing me solo and were like, hey, um, if you ever need help, you know, we could back you up. And so I talked to my band about it and they weren't too sour about it. So <laughs> I was like, you know, like I, I'm pushing all the wise guys music. Like this is still the band. And when we go on tour, I'm still selling wise guys, merch and wise guys, CDs. And it's, we're playing all those songs. Mm -hmm. So it's a slightly different representation. Um, but it is in an effort to get the wise guys to a point where we can all tour because they're a little bit older and have a little bit more of uh, like the responsibility side where you know, this isn't really a cheap place to live. So they've all got jobs that it's really hard to just take time off of and come back and still have a job. And yeah, that's the thing about and, being an indie and musician like that, people so. don't really realize is that everything is literally on you. You know, your job has to allow you to go. You have to make sure that you make enough money yeah. that it makes sense for you to not be at work. Um, you know, when it comes to, uh, I suppose, I like to call it indie financing. You're just riding down the road one day, you know, trying to get to the gig. Bam, flat tire. You know, like just stuff Dude. like that. Yeah. And... The, the, mm -hmm. It's the unexpected stuff that really lets you know once you're out there that you are a solitary commando group. You are dependent upon each other for survival and sanity. And, you know, you, there's yeah. there's one person in the band that can fix everything. There's one person in the band knows how to run the sound. You know, like everybody combines their talents together. And like you said, you're like an elite commando squad. Yeah. It's, you know, I even hate, I hate to bring it up because of the, you know, the stigma that it has, especially now with all the, all the bros and the, the, the entrepreneurship and how you really do learn that. Yeah. I mean, like if you, if you don't keep a little money on the side for shit, like a blown tire mm -hmm. or triple A, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and yeah, like, uh, we, we luckily we only had one one time to deal with AAA on the last tour. We locked our keys in the car, which, oh. you know, the smallest, you know, like, luckily, you know, AAA right before we left. Yeah, so it was, it was perfect. It before we went on stage, we had our keys back. So, yeah, you know, but as prepared as you think you can be, there's always something oh, else yeah. that can happen. Oh, and yeah. like you said, the sanity bit is, oh my God, that's huge. Because if you have people that you're going to fight with on the tour, because you're stressed the fuck out. Yeah. You know, yeah. me and my wife had maybe one argument last tour and that was like two weeks and like that i'm i'm super grateful for that because it is just we know that we're just we're here it's going to be stressful this is exactly what we signed up for we we asked yeah, for it we yeah. wanted it we booked it i'm not going to get mad about anything yeah, i you, can't you can't let shit stress me like, you know i did this and to I, I have a problem with that i'm a i'm a really stressed guy right. so um you know i can let a lot get to me but and I seem crazy when I don't, because I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. And it's like, you're not even going to, you're not going to worry. You're not going to focus on this problem. And it's like, if I do, I'm going to get mad. And what's that going to do? Like, now nah, we got to, I got to get somewhere where I can deal with the problem on a, without shitty emotions. Right. 
And I think that uh, <laughs> silence is also, I think, the, one of the biggest factors of being able to tour. Like, if you can be in a band where everybody knows how to be quiet for lengthy amounts of time, <laughs> it makes touring so much better. Mm. <laughs> but then when, after that's yeah. done, somebody will crack a joke about something, and then somebody will go off, and then, you know, you're back to talking again. But, you know, if you're just talking all the time, it's... Uh, right. Uh, but, but then you're like, uh, but there's still nobody else in the world I'd rather be around right now you know what i mean like it's stockholm yeah, but, it, but it's like anything <laughs> it's stockholm you live with them, you know why you don't <laughs> <laughs> why do i do this yeah to myself? it's it right and i mean as, a, as an artist you usually have a strong personality or if you don't seem like you do it comes out in those moments where you're with somebody 24 hours a day and yeah. it's like oh that's why you're so quiet because you're fucking crazy <laughs> <laughs> like like i get it and oh, you know i been stewing I'm this a talker, whole time. obviously if you yeah and it, yeah if you if you haven't been able to tell i i'm a talker but i also have those points where it's like nah i need to shut up everyone's got to shut the fuck up yeah yeah <laughs> i totally get that honestly especially when you're on tour i don't know about you but i would get all sorts of great creative ideas whether it's for writing or for musical arrangements and stuff and the worst thing is if everyone's quiet and everyone's got their own things going and someone says something and you're right out of the zone and you're like, I didn't even get a chance to write it down. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's, you know, respect is, is it, you know, yeah. you, you learn respect if you don't, if you have already gotten to that point where, you know, you're really good about viewing others and sympathy and empathy and stuff like that. It really drives it home that like, this isn't just me. Like even at a show, you know, where it's like, oh, if we all drive our own cars there and stuff, it's like, all right, sort of every man for himself until we get on stage. Yeah, yeah. And like, I don't like that feeling at all ever. Like I'm working on getting a van so that we can do that because I, I hate the the pieces kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. mean, when you're stuck in a van for two weeks with people, you got to learn to respect everything in your surrounding, everything. You got to learn to respect not just people's belongings but also their genuine mm -hmm. time also if they want to be alone because alone time mm -hmm. is also you know such a luxury on tour when yeah. someone wants to just and sit I, in a corner on their phone oh. you have to respect that <laughs> yeah i mean after every set i basically have to like have to go i mean i like i yeah. I, I'm not as fit as I'd like to be too. So I get out of breath really easily and I don't stay as hydrated as I should. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not super healthy. So when I get off stage, I'm about to die. And like, if, if people are coming around, even just saying like, Hey man, good job. It's like, go fuck yourself. Like I can't fucking breathe right now. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm to the point where I'm going to start bringing oxygen tanks on tour to fucking, you know, but it, it is really important. And it, it sometimes makes you feel bad too. Cause you're like, man, like I want to be able to give, people the chance to say you just need you know to, that's, whatever why, the, they that's why the merch stand and, exists with a chair behind it because you can sit down and catch your breath and if they <laughs> want to talk to you they come to yeah. the merch stand right and it's like dude well with with venues that aren't freezing cold in it it's like yeah. i i run to my car and i'll blast the ac for a minute <laughs> <laughs> you know like i just I, I put it all out there, you yeah, know, and yeah, when you do. you do shit like that, it's... You do. You don't just stand in one place. I, I do enjoy watching you perform. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I look and feel better than Vince Neil at this point, and that's that's my goal, <laughs> you know. Huge John Five fan, huge Motley Crue fan. I'm so glad he's playing, and Nikki Six and Tommy, you know, such fucking great guys. Um, it, even through all they've done and all they've been through, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. I, I, I love it, but... Yeah, it's kind of sad to see him up there, you know. <laughs> but you know, I, I, it's this has also driven me to get healthier um, because I don't. It, it, you, you look at typo negative, and for whatever reason, I can't even remember the lead singer's name. But he's like, I don't. It's my job. I'm not going to go up there and look like a slob. You want somebody attractive, and I mean, at least somebody who can do the job and not get winded. You know, I don't want to start dropping lyrics because I can't do it. I'd rather drop lyrics so people can sing. Right. You know? Well, I mean, Pete Steele also but, took vitamins and everything on stage with go. him. Like, he had in the back of the uh, bus, there was a weight bench. He had all of his vitamins. Mm -hmm. and, 
you know, I imagine that uh, he had a, a doctor who, you know, like a nutritionist because he could afford one. And, you know, I mean, he was in amazing and shape. That's, you know, but he was also like, you know, taller than you and me put together. So there's lots of room for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and again, that's from a privileged, a, a very privileged standpoint from when you don't have the worries of I got to work and I, I have like, I'm even to the point where like certain tasks throughout my day, I have to take an hour break. Mm -hmm. I, I literally have to sit down and do nothing for an hour or I'll, I'll fucking explode. You know, I, I've got my own <laughs> mental, my mental shit. And so I'm, I'm totally sympathetic to that. It's like, where do I fit working out? And even, um, Mac, the guy who played Mac on It's Always Sunny. Yeah. You know, he's like, yeah, it's super easy to keep this physique when the studio is paying for it all. You work two hours a day and you do all this shit. It's totally easy. You got a trainer. It's, like, yeah, it's, it's with... the easiest thing in the world when someone's paying you. Yeah. you got. They have a trainer with uh, exercises that are perfectly tailored to your body type and metabolism. And uh, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's real easy to get cut up when you have somebody giving you that constant motivation. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Lao Tzu and Taoism. And uh, one of the big rules okay. is our business is getting on with the business of life. And I feel that for just myself, that I have to maintain some sort of uh, physical regimen because I have injuries from Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I don't really get a, a choice to be, uh, to be immobile. So luckily playing upright right. bass and drums and all that, you know, kept me good and limber. But uh, as you said, you know, as we get older, fuck, dude, I hate tying my shoes. <laughs> dude, I, I blew my knee out on stage in 2021 and in 2022. And I'm fucking due for it again here within the next <laughs> oh, wow. month. And I mean, and you know, I, anyone who has medical anything, you know, knee problems are like, what do you do? Yeah. You can't stay off your knee. I deliver pizzas. Mm -hmm. I, I'm constantly walking. I'm on stage going crazy. And I mean, that scares the shit out of me. And so the the more that I can do, I mean, I can get less weight on my knee. You know, I can, you know, like you said, I can become more limber, do yoga and stuff like that. And it it is just really important, especially as I see, especially the connection I see between physical and mental health. I see my own mental capacity increasing as I eat healthier and I, I become healthier. And that was one of my biggest, uh, points of fear, I guess, especially in starting art again, is that everything moves just so fast that my memory, I just can't handle it. And I can't handle so much at one time. And I really want to be in a space where I can, cause that's what it takes. And doing the work to get there is it's, it's, you know, it's fucking tough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I myself have undergone quite a bit of therapy. And, uh, you know, when you can really start really retracing what those initial memories are that gives you the, I suppose, trigger responses as to why you have now, it's a lot easier to, uh, to kind of nip it in the bud because you know why you're thinking that way. You know why you're feeling that way as opposed to just feeling like there's this this uh the swirling din around you that uh, has no answers and you're just kind of stuck there instead start to get a little bit of a perspective and then the more that you realize these certain things that may have uh affected you then that's when our liberal superpower of empathy comes in and that's when we <laughs> we realize that you know, everybody has problems. Everybody has a story. And whether it's, you know, some stranger or your closest relative, however your life may have been wronged, you know, perhaps they don't know that they were doing it because they can only think a certain way because they were only taught a certain way. And uh, it's real hard to... Um, it's real hard to remain in an extremely dark place with yourself if you start to realize that everything that has affected you, well, something affected them once too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't, I don't know if it's a Taoist point, but it's very uh, Eastern. It's just acceptance. Yeah. Just accepting what is 
and you know and in the the western sense it's you know have the strength to change what we can and the patience to deal with what or the strength to deal with what we can't mm-hmm. and that you know that's the basic thing but i mean it's this is what's happening don't dissociate don't start building delusions based on what you expect and just deal with what is because it's a lot easier you know because one day you build so many delusions that you're getting slapped in the face constantly because everybody's got a different view and it's like man if we just we all see what actually is going on and you know i i also like i said i feel extremely privileged and grateful that i can even look at myself in in that sense and take a lot of these mental problems and know what i can do for myself um, where a lot of people don't and a lot of people are reliant and I, I don't even want to say it's wrong but reliant on uh, you know more medical attention um, to get them at least in that headspace to where they can make the necessary changes um, but also knowing that it's so society based you know we wouldn't have so many of these problems if we didn't have the American system you know and maybe her only the political punk now but <laughs> You know, like the the way things are set up, it's just it it's rigged to fail if you just if you just want to live, mm-hmm. and that sucks because everyone should have the ability to to not have to want to be something spectacular, to have, be successful. You know, to have all your bills paid, and it's like you really have to just constantly bust your ass when it's like you know, there's enough people that we really don't have to work forty hours a week kind of thing. If we if we had better you know, scheduling you know, ways to figure that out that everybody could learn and we could fill all these jobs and work 10 hours a week and just live, you know? And for the people who want to do more, obviously it's there. But it really sucks knowing that you have to commit so much of your life to something you intrinsically don't want to do because of the stigmas behind everything and the pressure and everything like that. And yeah, I mean, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think just you know, just well, honestly, when it comes to when it comes to being able to discuss politics of any kind, you know, it's real easy to start in one place and then you end up in another because it's all just so damned connected. <laughs> especially when there's a huge population who refuses to agree on a simple set of facts. Right. Because right. the idea that. If those facts were to perhaps come to light, then I would suppose the narcissistic collapse that would they would suffer would be so absolutely debilitating that the cognitive dissonance just has to uh, to protect them. And uh, right. Well, we'll see as far as uh, the future of politics goes, as more and more uh, juicier uh, bits seem to be dropping uh, that might possibly right. get us on to a, a simple set of facts that we can all agree on. But once more, that's just going to have to rely on a portion of population. Well taking their feelings, putting them on a shelf and saying, well, this is actual numbers with empirical data and people's actual words on camera. So, yeah, I mean, I can Mm -hmm. talk politics all day long. uh, You know, I don't like to talk culture wars because all they do is just fill the grifters pockets. I'll talk about legislation and I'll talk about exactly shifty media tactics that are used and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. But when it comes to just the uh, the basic culture war issues, it's really for people that don't have any other thing going on for them, and they need their hit of their daily hate math. <laughs> yeah, and I mean it is like you said, it's it's all that's all shady media tactics. I mean, like. <sighs> I'm of such two minds because I understand the problematic nature of a lot of the jokes that people made in the nineties. But I also feel like there was a much more freer place for people to talk and be checked and, you know, make it, it connect a little bit more where there is this hypersensitivity to man. I'm, I, I'm just talking shit. You know, I'm not an asshole. Like we're all just trying to have fun here and sometimes 
the joke is that it's extreme. The joke is that like, this is it true. You know, like that, that's the whole point. Everyone could joke at that or it's true and it's funny and it's different. And you know, like, Oh, I have the privilege to laugh at that. I understand that. Like I, I, I understand where all of that comes from, but the main, it, the main thing is, yeah, they're pitting everybody against each other in any single way that they can. So that that's ridiculous. Well, division sells catheters, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, I just I... this is why I like editing. See, I can we can stop and actually <laughs> think and talk and come up with what we're going to talk about next. And then see, this doesn't even exist. Like when we actually watch it, none of this will be here. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I think that, like, obviously, there is money in division. And too many people know it. I mean, the Fairness Doctrine was removed just so that conservative voices <laughs> would be able to be uh, amplified, right. by which they mean they could just lie right. their ass off because Roy Cohn, Rupert Murdoch, and Roy Ronald Reagan were in the same meaning when they removed the fairness doctrine. And mm -hmm. now we're dealing with uh, a political system where legislation and things like that, it doesn't matter. It's all about what was the angry tweet that got put out by the certain politician and how can we spin this into our nightly story? And it gets mm -hmm. really, 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 uh, really disheartening when people that you know who are good people, you can, you can put hard evidence in front of them and because it doesn't agree with their narrative, they'll just dismiss it and mm -hmm. it's really hard to to stay on an even political debate field because debate depends on empirical data and when people are just willing mm -hmm. to dismiss that because they heard what some pundit on television told them it's almost like people almost didn't get into understanding how politics works until it became like the intersection of reality and wrestlemania yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely a conspiracy theorist to uh to an extent, and I think I've got crazier theories than um some people, and I I I am of the understanding that, especially under capitalism, but it really it really doesn't matter what economic system politics is controlled by money. No, oh, yeah. Now I'm yeah. I don't believe that there's a certain religious group controlling all of that money. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that's where I stop my conspiracy is, you know, there's, I, I don't believe there's one religious group that's got all the money and is controlling everything, but I definitely believe that all of, especially American politics boils down to taking money out of American citizens pockets in any way possible. Every politician is an actor with a check and a script. And they, they it's basically, if you don't say this script, we'll probably fucking kill you. <laughs> and or find a way to make your life absolutely miserable by putting things because they're all pieces of shit so they have all this this back evidence so if you're not going to do what we want well we'll just show everybody you're, you're fucking with kids you're doing drugs you're doing whatever and you either do what we say or we're going to make sure you can't do anything else yeah and the russians call it's that pretty compromise. fucking obvious to me yeah like it, it you know, when you when you see who everyone's endorsed by and the the like you said, the legislation that they're putting through that directly helps certain companies and industries and their whole biggest decry is, oh, we'll we'll destroy this industry. And it's like, yeah, to create a new one. That's how economy works. Why? Like you guys stop here because Mr. Trump told you to stop here and I like keep thinking. You I know, appreciate like, when regulate, for example, what's going on in Ohio, in Ohio, when deregulation happens because they want it to happen and then things happen because of deregulation and then they refuse to take credit mm -hmm. for their deregulation and instead find a way to shift yep. blame because, well, there's a, 
half of Congress, I like to call the Roy Cohn Congress, because they all act just like that. It's bully, coward, victim, deflect, project, and it's absolutely maddening when you can see through it all. When you look and you see that certain donors from certain shady corporations or shady countries have donated to certain politicians and it's like the elephant in the fucking room. You know what I mean? And you, you can't do yeah. anything about it. Yeah, that's, uh, that is the biggest thing. And then you have people who are so diehard on both sides that, I mean, people that can see, like, I hate to even to group anybody, but especially like liberals, Mm -hmm. the the leftist america you know you can you can say that that's all happening on the right side but you can't see where it's happening right in front of your face like you know i i'm as independent as i can be because i know that it's same two sides of the same coin it's the same shit it's i can also understand where you need regulation for certain things and it also hurts certain things. So I'm not totally, everything needs to be regulated. Uh, it, it, not everything needs to be wrapped in fucking bubble wrap, you know, right. but obviously, like you said, in Ohio, we're so many people are screwed out of water and food and they're, oh, there's the whole conspiracy here in my head that they're trying to get rid of natural food. You know, how hard is it to find natural food in a fucking supermarket these days? even when you go to your local produce stuff. And now it's completely affected by legislation now because of what happened. There's so much food that's completely inaccessible now. Like, what do you do? Like you said, what do you, what do you do? We're completely helpless to shit like that. And okay, so you get into politics. Well, they're not going to let you in if you're not going to play the game. So you either learn to play the game and become a complete piece of shit or you get kicked out. I, I don't know. That's why I can only do what I do in my own life. And it's just so hard and you feel so selfish and get, you get that label of selfish and you're an asshole because you don't vote and you, you, you feel so helpless that there's nothing you can do and you just focus on yourself. It's like, well, cause I believe I could lead more people in a good direction than any fucking president we've had. I mean, FDR was, you know, walk, walk, what was it carry the carry a big stick line? You know what I mean? Is honestly what most of us need to go back to. And I don't, you know, I'm not super well versed on historical legislature on all the presidents. I'm, you know, whatever they shot John F. John F. Kennedy because he was a good one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you went to end the Fed. I don't know. Huh? John F. Kennedy went to end the Fed. Yeah, so they fucking got a patsy. The CIA took him out. The mob fucking, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm a conspiracy theorist in that sense, that any actual freedom fighter is actually going to get fucked with. When half the media is still championing you, you're not a fucking freedom fighter. I'm sorry, Trump, but when half the media is still parroting everything that you say and defending everything that you say, you're probably not legit. Like, unfortunately. Your, your pockets are lined with their money. Well, a big problem that we have in American politics is the whole both sides thing. And I have no problem saying that both sides are not the same currently in America. There is one side that wants democracy. It wants people to have liberty and to make the choices that they want to make. And there is one side that wants to tell you what to do and uh, support autocracy. So anyone that in the media, you know, does that whole both sides thing. I'm, I'm glad there's, you know, networks that I appreciate, like Midas Touch, that calls them out. And um, this generation that's coming after mine and yours, they're one of the most politically oriented generations possible because they're literally, you know, seeing liberties stripped away right in front of them, uh, you know, with the overturning of mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade and things of that sort. Uh, as far as a fun conspiracy theory goes, since we were talking about that, and with JFK, uh, I have to remember the name of the documentary. You might have to get on the old Google machines. But uh, apparently, <laughs> there's the conspiracy where after uh, one of their 
midnight trysts that Marilyn Monroe and JFK were laying and they were having a bit of pillow talk. And JFK told Marilyn Monroe mm. about aliens. He wasn't supposed to tell her, but oxytocin's running high. You know, uh, like, you know how it goes. Mm. And then, this is all conspiracy, mind you. Uh, after mm. the singing of the Mr. President public performance, well, basically Marilyn Monroe contacted Kennedy and said, you need to leave Jackie for me. Or I'm going to tell the world about aliens. And then she ODs. <laughs> and then the men in black showed up. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, dude, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. I, that. I mean, I can, you know, I can believe it. I mean, it's up there in the crazy conspiracies with uh, how Hendrix was murdered instead of, you know, overdosing and, well, more so asphyxiating on his own vomit because when they got him into the autopsy room and. They did the autopsy on him. Just gallons of red wine came pouring out of his stomach. Now, not digested wine. Just he was waterboarded with wine, basically. Uh, what ended up happening. Wow. Yeah. And um, the German gal that he was with at the time that it happened, she ended up committing suicide because I think she just might have known a little too much. But this is apparently the source for this conspiracy theory is, is that Mike Jeffries, his manager, was deep in the mob. And, you know, he was the one who was running Hendrix crazy, making him, you know, constantly play and play and play and play and play and play because, you know, we mm -hmm. always need more money. We need more money. Although, you know, Hendrix is building a studio mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, still. You need more money. And Mike Jeffries was taking all the money. And, uh, well, Hendrix had a lot of things happening, like paternity suits from around the world. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the later Hendrix stuff wasn't selling as well as the, um, you know, the singles, the Purple Hazes and the Foxy Ladies. So he was technically not bringing in not only as much as he used to, but he was worth more dead than he was alive. And Jeffrey's right, had the because then his records are sell. And Je well, also insurance policy. Yeah, true that. And, well, apparently, Jeffries died in a midair collision in one plane and another plane. And uh, nobody knows if that was an accident or not. But conspiracy theories can be fun as long as they've already happened in the past. They're kind of they're kind of fun. They're not based on stupid tropes. Right. When it's sort of like this could have just, you know, was somebody who's money hungry. And it, it's crazy to even think about. I mean, the fact that we're so far removed from that level of celebrity or whatever is that it, it breeds that like, that we just have no idea um, what could be going on behind the scenes. And so to hear shit like that is just like, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see, especially the, the more, the deeper you get yourself into the music industry and you realize what it's all about. And yeah. it's like, yeah, these people are fucking crazy, man. Like they'll do anything for money. Oh yeah. Like it's, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw the new Elvis movie, but yeah, nobody, I, I mean, nobody who had read the books or anything like that knew about, uh, Colonel Parker. Well, it was pretty well is, known, is that, uh, all the things that. That Colonel Parker did, you know, among us, uh, us Elvis fans, because it's real easy to see that, you know, he took all of his, I suppose, his huckstery nature from the carnival and put it into show business. And, you know, he just Elvis was just mm -hmm. his dancing, you know, his dancing, singing prodigy that was going to be the goose that laid the golden egg. I mean, he even had the anti-Elvis merchandise, you know, Tom Parker. Oh, or, genius. Yeah, I mean, he he was a bastard in a lot of ways, but he was also a genius in a lot of other ways too, you know. I mean, when you think of the music industry and bastards and stuff, you know, Don Arden, there's a great example, you know, in England, Sharon Arden, Sharon Osbourne's father, you know, mm -hmm. he was like the gangster mm -hmm. Of English music, you right. know, 
I think it was uh, Jimmy Page got the offer to join the Small Faces, and uh, Don Arden sent him a letter saying, how'd you like to play guitar with broken fingers? And he didn't join. And that's how we got Led Zeppelin. Jesus. <laughs> that's fucking crazy. Yeah, like, and I didn't even know yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, um, gangsters. Sorry, I had to look at my battery. No worries. Yeah, gangsters, dude, they all run the music industry. They all run politics. It's... It's all really the same. Anytime mm -hmm. that somebody can get another figure to make them vast amounts of money without that person doing work, you know, you're going to end up running and <laughs> run into that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's exactly what it is. Cause I mean, I, I guess for people like me and people who were a little more mystified or just didn't know all of the, the history behind it, you know, it gives you a really big, that movie and and learning about Tom Parker mm -hmm. and yeah. you know everyone's like oh you know Elvis ended up washed up playing Vegas for the rest of his life no. and all unhealthy and fat and then you realize that it's literally all just because of him he was I mean like he he didn't leave his room yeah. because he he was so in debt and just ah uh, and I'm, yeah it's it's horrible like when he could have been traveling the world doing exactly what he wanted to do, he was so confined and then got a bill for everything he had already paid for. Now, I mean, <laughs> like, what the fuck? Well, I mean, the idea of being confined like that, too. Could you imagine the idea of you can't go anywhere without everyone just losing their absolute living mind that they see you? Not that they met you, not that they, have anything, mm -hmm. that they saw you. Just the fact that they can say, I saw Elvis is a story they could tell their grandkids. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, we'd never yeah. had any, I mean, Sinatra maybe, but we'd never had the closest thing to an actual like pop icon like that. And, you know, Elvis, you know, being just a good old boy from the South, he wasn't ready for this nonsense. No one was ready for that level of celebrity. Right. And, uh, you know, Parker knew it. That's the thing is he knew what he was doing. There wasn't a, a single move that he made that he didn't know what he was doing. It's uh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a damn shame. Yeah. I mean, for as many great things as he did do for, I mean, the first uh, satellite telecast around the world from Hawaii, like yeah, that's, yeah. that's really fucking cool. I mean, you know, the first, I mean, that was like the first legit Vegas residency, right? Like mm -hmm. he like solidified that. And so, I mean, it's, it's cool stuff, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you learn when the people who are just in control of the money, what they'll do for it is yeah, exactly. real, real shitty. A, a, a real cool thing on Elvis is there's a documentary, find it on the Memphis mafia, like the, his group of buddies that hung out with them all the time, went everywhere mm -hmm. that he went, mm -hmm. partied with them and you know, all the shenanigans that they got up to and then would have to get into the studio the next day and stuff. Find that documentary. That is mm -hmm. well worth watching. If you really want to know some good stuff about Elvis. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's really funny because we talked about getting healthy and I wanted to bring up before and I don't know what's totally appropriate and what's not. But when it goes on with the shenanigans and the fun you want to have uh, being healthy, uh, when you want to do drugs, it, it really helps, <laughs> uh, you know, especially as you get older, you know, if you, you know, if it, you have your fun and whatever, I'm not saying I'm not doing lines of coke to do this interview, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. But at a show occasion, I'll take a little quarter of an X pill to just, you know, have a, a little more over the top. You yeah, know? And yeah, it'll uh, I, it, a little show. It hurts answer. a little bit more <laughs> um, <laughs> afterwards if you if you don't stay in shape. Um, and that's and you you see it in yeah. a lot of artists too, yeah. where that's one of the reasons for their their deaths and stuff is because their hearts give out and you know they they just can't keep up with it and I'm. You know, it's not for everybody, and I'm not saying it's a horrible thing either. You know, if you have your fun, you have your fun. Don't let it turn you into an asshole. That's no. basically all you got to worry about. Don't die. Don't spend all your money on it. Don't let it turn you into an asshole. And, you know, everything in moderation. Yeah, I mean, you know, partying is one thing, but uh, when it gets to the point that it's not only interfering with your finances, but it's also interfering with your I suppose your professional career and your health, you know, I mean, 
I've done my fair share of partying, various kinds. And, uh, you know, a good example of something I don't do anymore is, is just acid because the I'm 41 and the come down sucks. My body hurts. I don't do it what anymore. Do uh, cocaine just gotcha. makes me I, sneeze. I feel that. <laughs> I sneezed for two weeks yeah. last time I did. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty pretty not into the nose stuff yeah. anymore, especially as as the stuff that gets mixed in, man. I, I, I'm I getting old and getting scared. Of, of <laughs> yeah, 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 that's like, a I, thing too. If I don't know what's in it, you know, I'm sure your stuff's good, bro. Like, I'm sure it's great, <laughs> but like, you know, I don't know. I, I would rather have a little bit more control of my own yeah, yeah. intake. And that, I mean, that... I just like to do acid. I mean, I probably trip once every three months or so. Yeah. And it really just, it, you know, it gives me that, it, it keeps me positive, really. It, it gets me back into that childlike state and keeps that positive aspect of my brain up. And right. um, I'm not saying that getting healthier and just doing that wouldn't, you know, I, I I'm also uh, <laughs> cognizant of that, right, that right? I could probably just meditate and do stuff like this, but I do turn to substances because they do different things to my mind. Um, and, and I enjoy them, you know, like but the yeah, that, that, uh, <laughs> that after is definitely a thing. Well, uh, this would be the time where if you have any plugs to put out there, go ahead, man. All right. Uh, so we got the new single coming out March 4th. That'll be Paradise. Uh, we've got our live seven inch split with the cutoffs coming out March 26th. Um, we've got the new EP in the mirror coming out May 20th. Um, check out the Jump Scares. That's uh, a horror punk recording project that I sing in now. Uh, we should have an EP out hopefully sometime this spring. Um, Check out Mr. Uh, Mr. Fang and the Dark Tones because they're fucking cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Jacob, pretty, yeah, anyone that one of my the, best homies. The podcast previous to yours, I'm sure they'll be doing that, and I'm sure that Jacob will appreciate the <laughs> shout out. Thanks so much for coming on, Steve. It's been a pleasure, dude. Good. Dude, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm so honored to be a part of this, dude. It's been an absolute blast, and uh, we'll have to do it again. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, you can tell I have a lot to talk about. <laughs> well, it's a good thing because uh, we seem to be able to get along well. I guess we'll have to be doing this again in the future. Oh, yeah, man. Let me know. And I'm sure we'll talk before then. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care of yourself. All right. That'll be all for today. Remember, peace, love throughout the world, and don't forget to rock and roll.